Thank you. So, uh, a couple of introductions first of all. Um, I'm a group analyst, that means I'm like a psychoanalyst, but I can juggle eight people at the same time, so my earning potential is much, much greater. Uh, <laughs> Hannah, this is Greenbelt. Greenbelt, this is Hannah. Please say hello to Hannah. Hello. <laughs> hello. Hello. Give, given you're a neuroscientist and we're going to be talking about brains, we've scoured the site all morning, looking for the best and brightest examples of brains the site has to offer, and um, I can only apologise. <laughs> so, sorry, I, I can only apologise the tent isn't bigger, and we can't get even more brainy people in, but the ones we've got look absolutely filthy. Um, <laughs> Hannah, actually, we didn't talk about this bit, but you're a neuroscientist based at Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. You also uh, present TV programs. You've just done the family brain game with Dara Breen. You're a writer. What, what else would you like people to know you as? <laughs> um, uh, How about that thing in Nature magazine? Oh, we touch yes. On that? This was, so this was fantastic. Um, uh, so I found out via Twitter world um, that somebody, uh, an old colleague, an old friend uh, that I was a student with uh, about 10 years ago actually got in touch to say, Hannah, uh, you're in Nature magazine, which is an incredible scientific magazine to be in. Um, some so a magazine that I didn't, you know, it's the holy grail yeah. for, for scientists to be published here. And it was um, listing me and, as one of the two rising stars in biology at Cambridge University. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I was like, whoa. And then even more interestingly, um, I was there. The other person that was listed was one of my best friends, Roger, who's another neuroscientist. So both of us were there just going, hang on, hang on a second. Hang on. <laughs> so that was nice. And this is how much we love you. This is the sort of person we bring to you. Uh, can I also say at this point, I'm sorry that some of you are getting to see Hannah and others of you are getting to see me. And I really can only apologize for that. If, if, if someone would blow a whistle at half time, we'll, we'll change ends, okay? So let's, look, let's get into this. Let's start with the most important question of all. How much does Dara Breen get paid for being the face of the Megabus? <laughs> he gets paid loads. I didn't get paid very much for that. <laughs> let's talk about you, though, because I, I know you, you say in the book that you, you kind of started a lot of this interest through experiences around neuropsychiatry, but actually, the, I mean, the book is beautiful. I really enjoyed reading this. Um, it's, it's, it's so easily written. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I find it very easy to get on with. And um, you, you actually start in the book by talking about two important people in your life, your father and your son. So I just wonder if you wanted to say a little bit about where you come from, really, and why these people were so important to you. Yeah, so... Um, uh uh, so I started really being interested in biology about 20 years ago, um, and I did my undergraduate degree looking at molecular pathways and looking at how genes are expressed and proteins are then produced and how that switches on particular pathways that give rise to these different ways that our cells work and interact with each other in our bodies. And I just found something very beautiful um, about the mechanistic way that you can try and make sense of how our bodies operate um, by studying cell and molecular biology. Um, now, I, I find myself as a mother of a three and a half year old little boy called Max. Um, and uh, I, I was starting to write this book on the science of fate and, and my intervening years of studies had, had been looking more at brain and behavior and how there's similar similarities between our brains and how um, there's genes that are there and proteins and nerve cells that are being constructed into neural circuits and pathways within our, within our mind that actually give rise to the way that we process information from the world around us, make sense of that information, and how then that gives rise to all of our complex behaviours and our habits and also our life stories, in essence. Um, and each of us has this very individual cartography of the mind. We each of us have a very unique um, s kind of set of connections within our brains. So our brains are composed of about 86 billion nerve cells, and each one of those nerve cells is connected to about 10,000 other nerve cells. So we've got about 100 trillion connections within our mind. And that 
that set of connections, that's, that connectome, as it's called, is very different from person to person. There's no single person on this planet that has a matching and identical connectome. Um, and it's this breadth, this, this complexity within our brains that allows us to have such breadth of behavior that we can each exhibit. Um, and so I found that, and uh, trying to understand that, something that I really wanted to do. I found it very compelling for a number of reasons, which we'll probably kind of get into in a little bit later. But um, so I, I was starting to write my book, The Science of Fate, um, looking very mechanistically at how our brain operates, how it gives rise to our decisions and choices in lives. Um, and then at the same time, and as my other role, not as a neuroscientist, but my, as my other everyday role as a mother of my child, I was also being faced with this decision that I had to make. Um, so my dad uh, went to his, G to his GPs as a part of a routine checkup, which I think uh, people that are 65 or older... I wouldn't know. <laughs> ...have to go for. And he was offered this test, this just standard kind of blood screening test, which measured his iron levels in his blood. And what they discovered was that his iron levels were something like a thousand times what they should be, and that he actually had this inherited condition called chromatosis, which means that his... Um, body was just accumulating more and more and more iron in his blood and it was actually getting into in his organs and causing some quite severe um, problems uh, for him. And so over the last two years, he's actually been go undergoing weekly bloodletting where they actually take yeah. out a pint of blood each week um, in order to decrease the iron levels. And now, thankfully, they've gotten back. They've returned to something more like 100 times what they should but, be but rather than a thousand times. But you said this is an inherited condition. <coughs> exactly. So this is an inherited condition. And, um, and so the GP was saying, you might want to talk to your family and find out whether they want to be tested for whether they are also carriers or whether they're going to exhibit this chromatosis later on in life. Um, in much the same way as if uh, a mother might um, have breast cancer and might be carrying the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes, maybe her family members would also want to get tested as well to find out what the future might hold in store for them. And so at the same time as writing this book on the science of fate, I was having to think about whether I should go and get tested for a chromatosis. And it, on the, on the, in the grand scheme of things, it seems like a really simple decision. You go and you give a little bit of blood, and then you find out whether... You, um, you're more likely to get chromatosis later on in life. And if so, you just decrease your iron consumption. You make sure you don't have too much spinach, for example, or black pudding. I love black pudding. Uh, and maybe even red wine. There's quite a lot of iron in red wine, uh, now for example. it's getting serious. <laughs> now it's getting serious. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's quite a simple decision to make. And yet I found myself um, kind of putting off going to the GPs to go and get this test. I, my son at the time was... Um, just a year and a half. And I, I, and I was already feeling quite overwhelmed with all of the different decisions that I had to make as a parent for this young child. You know, would this be an extra responsibility that I'd have to um, consider? Or maybe actually it would be an empowering to have that information. And obviously in the end, I did go and get the test. But I found it really interesting to start thinking about how there's so many... You know, from the face of it, writing the science of fate, of, of course we should all know what dangers might, what, what dangers we might harbour within us. And so we can start acting responsibly and, and kind of uh, looking after ourselves and our friends a little bit, a little bit with more information at hand. But actually, um, when it comes down to it, there's quite a lot of things that you've got to start to consider. And it's quite difficult decisions to make. Um, and one of the things that interested me reading the book is that I think at a number of points, your personal experience and th the effect these things have on you directly kind of um, don't exactly clash with, but they, they meld with and they complement, but they also in some ways hold a bit of tension with some of the things that you know as a scientist. Um, and we will talk a bit more about that in a bit. But the, the main contention of the book is basically, well, look, I think... I. I think you take until the chapter on belief before you come clean. Mm -hmm. And you basically say, there is no such thing as free will. Yeah. So, so um, going back to the chromatosis, when you think about uh, what was being offered for my son there, would we want to, um, would I want to, have also looked at other indicators that were, were within, hiding within his blood and within um, some of the 
uh, some of the signals there to find out whether he also might have a propensity to certain other conditions like, for example, um, autism or schizophrenia or how intelligent he might be later on in life, um, how long he might live, um, whether he might have resilience to mental health conditions or whether he might be more likely to suffer from depression or bipolar, for example. Um, all of these things we're increasingly finding um, because of we're living in this era of the brain where there's all these new technologies that are allowing us to peer into the mind as never before. So scientists are now able to look at conscious moving mammals as they go about their everyday business and watch the connections that I was talking about earlier change within their brain and watch the electricity kind of fizz around the, across the circuit board, this connectome of your mind. And you can watch as animals are making different decisions in their life and trace how those decisions and those choices are being made. And increasingly, what we're seeing and what we're finding as neuroscientists is that there seems to be quite a lot of our behaviors from the everyday simple choices, such as, for example, what we choose to eat, to the more complex, higher cognitive um, kind of decisions in our life, for example, our career choices, or uh, even our temperaments and our personality that might be laid down, how they might be pre-wired. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's been this genomics revolution, which means that we can now start to sequence the 3.2 billion base pairs that are individual to each of us, the DNA within our cells. Just, we can just, start to just, sequence all of that. Just say that again very slowly, because to me it sounded like we can spot 3.25 million base players. Ba <laughs> the base player, not the base players, the base pairs. Of see, that, that is a lot more base players than any country needs. <laughs> That would be wonderful if we had lots of bass players within our, <laughs> within our bodies, just <laughs> kind of but, making some nice but, music there. But is the thrust of this that increasingly you find yourself thinking that actually we imagine we're making choices, but we're, we're not? Yeah, so, so when you look, so going back to the connectome, um, when you look at a... There's been these amazing researchers based at King's College London that are working as part of a consortium with scientists across Europe. And they've developed this new technology um, which allows them to image a baby in the womb, 20 weeks gestation, so just 20 weeks old. And you can start to see these neural circuits being laid down in this baby's brain. And they can actually image through all the amniotic fluid and they can correct for all the movements that a ba the baby is, being, is making there. And they can get these wonderfully detailed images of this neural circuitry being laid down in the baby. And they're um, making all of their data open source and available. And mm. when I last spoke to them, they'd imaged, I think it was... 330 pregnant mothers and, and the children inside them. And what they were finding was that there's little signatures or fingerprints, if you like, within that neural circuitry, which seems to indicate what the child might have a sensitivity to later on in life. Now, they're based in the neonatal unit at King's College um, London, the, the St. Thomas Hospital, I think it's yeah. called. Um, uh, and so their, their primary focus is looking at babies that are born preterm to find out whether they might have any medical conditions later on in life. So that's their primary focus, is looking at medical diagnosis. And what they found that there's, is that there's signatures within that neural circuitry that seems to indicate whether those babies are going to develop autism, for example, or even schizophrenia or psychosis. So even um, complex conditions where the symptoms might not emerge for another 20 years, another two decades, they're seeing that there's this underpinning there. Now, this perhaps isn't surprising because, as I was saying, there's this genomics revolution that's enabling us to sequence these 3.2 billion bass players within each of our cells. And, um, and uh, what that genomics information is also telling us is that there's this high hereditary or genetic basis to really complex um, behaviours as but, well. But actually, this has got very significant everyday impact. So we were talking just before we started with Michael, who introduced us, and someone came and offered him an ice cream, which he refused, and you pointed out that that wasn't his choice, that that was what he was programmed to do. Yeah, so Michael, uh, hi Michael, everyone's gonna now know that he's, he doesn't, he's not that um, fussed about sweet, sugary things, and he prefers much saltier kind of cheese, for example, savory things, maybe with a high fat content, but a bit saltier. Red wine. Yeah. 
If, if anyone wants to buy a red wine, then um, he's, he will happily accept that, but not, not an ice cream. Um, now, but, but, he gave, but he gave an alternative explanation, which was that he was severely damaged as a young person working on an ice cream van, <laughs> providing hyper children with sugar and butter fat daily. <laughs> so, you know, this is a roundabout way of saying this, this discussion about nature, mm -hmm. what we're born with, and nurture, what develops. Well, okay, so I went to Warwick University in the early 80s. My tutor was uh, Gina Rippon, who you interview in your Radio 4 documentary. I, I was the first person accepted on the course there, aged eight, I have to point out. Uh, and, you know, at that point they were saying, look, actually, the state of the art is, yeah, it's maybe 50% nature, 50% nurture. And actually, how much further on than that are we 40 years later? Because it seems to me you can't, well, in the book, you, you do own up to the fact that actually early developmental experiences do seem to matter as well. Absolutely, yeah. And it, and, and what... And it very much depends on what type of behaviour we're talking about. Um, so, uh, in, in the case of our weight, how much we w might weigh, it seems as though as much as 70% of that might be due to a genetic basis. No, 70% is due to red wine. <laughs> and whether you, you particularly have a nucleus accumbens with a dopamine receptor subtype yeah. that seems to be particularly motivated and derive lots of pleasure from red wine in particular. <laughs> um, so, so the genes that you were given from your mum and dad, uh, the different alleles that you were given, are, match, um, are kind of mixing together to give rise to these different genes which then go and direct how that neural circuit is built as you're a baby in the womb. And there's different things that can... And so that's the kind of the, the, the code, the instruction manual, if you like. But then there is scope for plasticity. There is scope for change. Not everything is kind of laid down by that 20 week period. And, and you know, we're not these kind of, we don't emerge into this, the world as little robots that can't change. We can't learn new things. Of course we can. And that's actually the basis for consciousness. It's our ability to form a subjective view of the world. It's our ability to have this, uh, this um, scope for flexibility and plasticity within our brain so that we can learn from our environment and remember new things and then start to react to, to situations based on what we've learned before. But if I've understood your case right, it's that actually we are predisposed to being more or less able in different arenas. So for, you, you talk about the black cab study where black cabbies in London have got a, a, a bigger developed hippocampus. And of course, what we don't see are all the people who fail the knowledge who may not have the ability to develop the growth in the hippocampus. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, precisely. So... So, um, so just going back to the, the, the discussion on food preference, there's scope for plasticity there and change. So when Richard, was it Richard? Michael. Michael, sorry. Dave. Michael was a baby in his mother's womb. Um, the genes from his mum and dad were uh, kind of interacting and laying down his neural circuitry within the womb. But then also what, is, what the mum was eating would also have an effect um, because the chemicals would also send a signal through the amniotic fluid which would affect Michael's brain development. And there's been some wonderful studies by uh, Professor Marion Hetherington, who's based at Leeds University, who's been looking at this, looking at whether a mother, if she eats... This is <laughs> such a middle-class kind of uh, experiment that she did. And we're so not middle-class <laughs> here. <laughs> she looked at... <laughs> She looked at mothers that were eating hummus, uh, and um, <laughs> obviously... So, uh, which was this Waitrose hummus? hummus I don't know, she didn't specify the supermarket, but, so, but some of the hummus, um, and this, this gets <laughs> even better, some of the hummus had been flavoured with caraway seeds. <laughs> um, and basically, the, um, the, if, <laughs> if Michael had been in... Michael? Michael. You keep on confusing with Richard for some reason. I'm not quite sure. Well, sorry. If Michael had been in the womb uh, whilst his mother was eating hummus with caraway seeds, then um, he would start to associate that wonderful warm environment in the womb uh, with caraway seeds and hummus. And then as a baby, he would start rolling towards... Even, you know, just as a, a few, few hours old, he'd start rolling towards the smell of <laughs> caraway seeds hummus. And later on as a child and then as an adult, he would automatically kind of move towards it because his neural circuitry um, had been had 
uh, was wired such that his nucleus accumbens, this region that's involved in motivation and reward and pleasure that lights up also with red wine, possibly, um, would, uh, would also associate with his hypothalamus, which is kind of implicated in kind of uh, how our appetites are shaped. And he would just feel this association of warmth and pleasure from caraway seeds and hummus. But there's lots of lovely examples like that yeah. that show that you can change the food preferences during these very early experiences, but that they are largely and up to 70% shaped by the genes that you are dealt so from your mum and given dad. You haven't been to Greenbelt before. You may not know, but Greenbelt started back in the mists of time uh, by a group of evangelical Christians who liked rock music. So there is a, a very deep kind of rooting in not just faith of Greenbelt, but also in evangelical Christian traditions, which is significantly predicated on the idea that an individual can choose to follow God or not. Now, I, I know we, when we talked, you said you, theology isn't your area of expertise, nor is it mine. Mm -hmm. But again, there's a long-standing debate within orthodox mainstream Christianity about the notion of predestination, which goes back way before the Re Reformation, but whether people are called by God, as in the tribe of Israel, or whether people choose God, as in a Damascene conversion, St. Paul. And, um, and this continues today because the Anglican Church has a very significant underpinning structure of covenant theology, which allows children to be baptized at birth, pretty much, whereas adult uh, baptism is practiced by Baptists who say, no, you have to be old enough to make your own Baptist adult decision. choice. It does sound like you're saying that it's quite possible no one here has actually chosen to follow Christ, that this may just be what they were born with. Um, there is a chapter within the book that looks at beliefs and how beliefs mm. uh, are formed within the brain. And a lot of that goes back to how our perception of the world is formed. So if you imagine that you're, each one of us um, has a slightly skewed perception or sense of reality about the world, and it's based on, it's largely based on our previous experiences and I, how, how our brain I, is I, should, I should note, Hannah, space. to some of us, just the idea that our perception is in any way skewed <laughs> just shows how wrong you are. <laughs> but that's a really important starting place to understand that other people do see the world slightly differently to us. And there's a very good bi biological reason for that. So your brain uses about 20% of your daily energy quota, which is a huge amount. It's a huge amount. And your brain is, you know, it's a very energy, greedy, hungry beast. And the reason that it needs all this energy is because it's got these 86 billion nerve cells uh, that are firing away using the power of electricity, which is hugely um, oxygen consumption. It mm. uses a huge amount of energy and oxygen in order to do this. Um, and so your, your body is there kind of almost serving your brain so that you can process all the inf information that's coming in through your senses, through your sense, uh, your sight, your, your hearing, your sense of taste, your sense of balance, your sense of touch, um, trying to process all of these incoming signals. Um, and obviously, it's being bombarded all the time by all these signals that are coming in. So at the moment, as you're probably, hopefully, trying to concentrate on what I'm, we're saying and what we're talking about and trying to fit it into your existing framework of knowledge, you're probably filtering out as much as you can how sweaty your bottom is on your seat because and you're you're not thinking about that sensation you're just ignoring that we sensation we are now <laughs> now you are thinking now that i've uh, changed your attention and your focus to it mm. but there's all of these signals from the outside world that your brain just starts to ignore and it and it does this by making assumptions based on our past experiences um and i did have some audio kind of uh, illusions that were that, would, that could illustrate this point. And if you um, listen to my audio book, then uh, you can listen to them. But um, basically, our sense of reality is very much shaped on how we process information and which bits of information we ignore and which bits we prioritize, which is based on our previous experiences. And if you think about the fact that each of us has a very unique set of previous experiences and previous environments that we've been in, we each ignore certain certain aspects and try and fit in what we hear and what we see into our existing framework of the world because that's less cognitively and energy-wise costly for our brains. So um, we almost try to ignore any information that might be coming in 
from the outside world that would cause us to change our belief about the world around us. So each of us has this slightly skewed version of reality that's based on our past experiences and past on our genes that were given to us that, that uh, kind of dictated how our brains were wired together in the first place. Um, but then there's this one, and this, and, and this, um, this perception of the world also helps us to predict what's going to happen in the future. And in some ways, that's what a belief is. A belief about the world is our, our brain's ability to make some kind of prediction, some kind of idea of what's ab and to, to help prepare us for what's going to happen in the future. Um, and uh, there's different mechanisms within our brains that help us to try and protect ourselves and also to get us to a more accurate depiction of reality. And religion is one way that I think our brains have been wired uh, for us to move towards this idea of having some spiritual ideology. Um, so, for example, each of us within our brains, we have, to a larger degree or to a smaller degree, we are wired to be sociable. We are wired to enjoy um, exploring new places, meeting new people, and discussing different ideas with each other. Um, and that helps us to... Uh, as we exchange our ideas, our perceptions about the world, that helps us, each of us, to form a more accurate version of reality. And there's been some wonderful scientific studies that subjectively and objectively study this and find out that if we do indeed discuss our ideas with each other, then we are much more likely to arrive at a more accurate representation of the world and so therefore make better decisions. And if you think about the way that majority of religions have been set up, they also really bury deep into our nucleus accumbens, this yes. reward pleasure area of the brain. Not only do they offer you um, a sense of community, a sense of support within your tribe, a sense of the f a way by which you can exchange ideas without being judged, um, but they also have, you know, these these glor that you, you know, quite often they have glorious architecture to accompany that, so that you're visually being uh, stimulated and deriving quite a lot of pleasure from again, that. Again, I do have to say though that. This will come as great news to many people here that on a Sunday morning they're going along to have their reward pleasure centres activated. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's oh, off time. You. Right. Sorry, you've got a really sweaty seat there. Sorry. <laughs> you know nothing. <laughs> um, uh, and then, hello. <laughs> this is nice. <laughs> they're nicer. <laughs> Look, um, I, I, we could talk about this for ages because... Uh, <laughs> oh, no, can I go back to... The, this is something really that I really yeah. believe in as well. Also, there's... Um, at the moment, uh, there's quite a lot of talk in the press about us living in a, a loneliness epidemic where each of us feels slightly disconnected. Um, and anything that offers us the ability to do synchronised activity... Um, whether it's kind of synchronized exercise, like taking part in a, a marathon together, joint running kind of activities, or rowing, or um, whether we're singing. Horizontal jogging. Horizontal jogging. <laughs> or whether we're singing with each other. It releases huge amounts of beta endorphins, uh, and also this, this dopamine release within the nucleus accumbens, which keeps us really happy, and it helps us to... Um, this type of activity actually helps us to... Okay, so if you imagine that your brain is taking in information from the world outside all the time and then converting it into electrical signals and then trying to process all these electrical signals at the same time, then actually what your brain isn't doing is it isn't taking in all the information as a continuous stream. Actually what it's doing is it's taking snapshots of information before the next nerve cell can fire because they, it, kind of, it takes the time for the, for the electric signal to go from one end of the nerve cell to another and you can only send one signal at a time. So it's taking this information as snapshots and then your brain uh, brings all this information together into this continuous stream so that you see the world as this video rather than as different stills. Now, if, you're, um, uh, if you take part in synchronous activities with each other and if you look people in the eye and if you sing with each other in particular, then what's that do what, that, what that's doing is actually synchronizing the electrical oscillations across the brain um, between the different individuals. So you are literally taking in the same information from the outside world at the same time. So that can really help with um, 
making people feel like they're seeing the world in the same way because they're literally starting to. And, and as you know from you know the conversations we've had, I'm desperately keen to persuade you that all of these things fit very well with the group analytic model and this is partly why we sit in a circle. So you do look at everyone in the eye. But um, rather than group analysis, I know another area you, you really did want to talk about was the ethics attached to some of this uh, development and knowledge. And I mean, you, it's, it's, <coughs> quite, it's quite casual the way at the start you said, and you say this clearly in the book, basically, if we look carefully enough in the right ways at these brain scans of these fetuses, which is just extraordinary. The idea you can MRI a fetus is just mind-blowing, literally. Mm -hmm. We can probably tell which of them is going to be financially successful, academically successful, how sociable they're going to be, as well as the, these sort of slightly harder areas of having particular areas of hereditary disease. Mm. And the ability to do that throws up huge ethical questions. Yeah, absolutely. And which that's, that's really the main reason for why I wanted to start writing this book. So um, uh, in the last year and a half, there's been the development of new technologies, which mean that even if you're just eight weeks pregnant, um, you can take a sample of the mother's blood. And then within that blood, you can find some circulating fetal blood so that you can start DNA sequencing Okay, so just the even baby. blood sampling. Yeah, right. the, just, at, just at eight weeks. Um, and then you can get a lot of information, uh, obviously, from that baby's DNA. Um, at the same time, there's lots of IVF uh, kind of companies, particularly in America, that have taken all of this information looking at the genetic basis of intelligence, for example. And I have to say that all of this information is... So we're, so we're kind of... We're just finding out all of this information at the moment. Uh, there's been big studies looking at hundreds of thousands of people. And, in fact, the NHS have been investing heavily yeah. in this in the 100,000 Genome Project, um, looking at genetic basis, for example, things like... Uh, anorexia, uh, um, um, schizophrenia, but also on on the on the other side, you know, resilience to mental um, ill health, um, physical health, and also longevity, socioeconomic status, and intelligence. Example, for example, and there's already companies um, within America that are taking these preliminary results and offering couples that are opting to go down the IVF route to then selectively implant the embryos that they say, using these very preliminary scientific results, are less likely to go on to develop autism in the future and are much more likely to be intelligent, for example, and have a higher earning potential. And, and as a simple person, Hannah, explain why you think there might be a problem with that. Um, well, so, I mean, to start with... Do, we've, do we've, we not all want perfect blue-eyed, blonde... Children? Yeah, really? I mean, this idea of eugenics has had this really um, controversial history, and, and quite rightly, uh, people are very concerned about it. Um, and really, as a society, I think we have to start asking whether we want to celebrate the breadth of neurodiversity, the breadth that our staggeringly beautiful, mesmerizing brains can offer with these amazing circuit boards that we each have this individual, unique cartography for, whether we want to say that actually that gives our species strength. If you look at the yes. case of Greta, for example, with her um, possible diagnosis of autism, you know, actually that's, she, she's pioneering this movement. She sees things in, in this very black and white situation for and climate, white, yes. and, and she's acting on it very pragmatically. And if you look, I mean, even at the example of bees in a colony, for example, yeah. there are some bees within a colony that will carry a particular genetic alteration within their bee genome, um, uh, which means that they are less likely to, when a um, calamity like the queen, for example, dies or if an intruder comes in, they are much less likely to react in and, and um, get caught up in emotional contagion. And in, instead, they will act much more pragmatically and just practically try and sort the problem out. Now, the genes that these bees possess, that genetic alteration, is analogous to the genetic alteration that occurs in those people with autism, for example. And you can see how both situations on, on particular scales can actually be beneficial um, to, and, and we to were the talking species. A bit bit earlier about the theory behind group analysis where our understanding is that you, you need to think about a group of people as comprising a 
healthy wholes. You might, as an individual, have a particular deficit, whether that's in the form of a diagnosable psychiatric presentation, like, say, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. or perhaps depression, or just that you're someone who's a bit so socially awkward. Although you've got a particular area of need or deficit, actually, the bulk of you is healthy. And when you bring people together, what you get is all the healthy bits and the opportunity to exchange around the areas of deficit. And I think there's something very significant about the notion. And again, in terms of Christian theology, this is a very, very well-practiced idea that actually perhaps we do really need everyone, even the ones we dislike and disagree with, never mind who are particularly different in neurodiverse ways, mm -hmm. for instance. Yep, exactly. Um, look, again, we could, we could stay with ethics for, for ages, but... I'll, we can I just, I, I do want to get into an, another, can I just talk about yeah, another technology, which is CRISPR-Cas. I don't know whether you've heard of CRISPR-Cas gene editing technology um, recently, so some of you have. So there was um, a scientist in China who's just, who has recently actually been uh, expelled from his hosting academic unit for, for the work that he performed. But he basically got some couples that were undergoing IVF and he used this gene editing technology. So not, not only now can we sequence, can we read our genome and try and make predictions about our future as an individual, but also there's this new CRISPR-Cas gene editing technology, which means that we can start to edit up to 10,000, 18,000 even genes at, at, any, at a time in one cell. And what he did was that he did this for the first time across the world, he did this um, without ethical approval. He started editing some embryos pre-implantation um, and he edited them to, uh, he claims, confer HIV resistance yeah. to these baby, twin baby girls that were born. Now, interestingly, the genes that he changed also in some studies in mice um, have also conferred an enhanced memory and learning capability. So these baby girls have now been born um, and they have been genetically altered. The, the people that invented the CRISPR-Cas gene editing technique are horrified that this has happened without any ethical approval. And sh the, the leader um, is actually, she is calling for a worldwide memorandum and discussion about how we start to use this technology or how we don't use this technology, you know. And I think that's really what we all need to start doing, thinking about what... What, what do we want our future society to look like? Do we want to be tinkering away and editing things? And if we are going to be editing things, is this only available to those people that can afford it? Um, and what kind of society are we moving towards? Okay. Look, we're, we've got to keep some time to allow people to join in the conversation with us. Before we do that, can we come back to you a little bit? Because mm. one of the things, uh, you know, I, we hardly know each other, and I don't mean to be rude, but, but one of the things that appeared to me reading the book was that you've got really good reason to want to be a biological determinist. You know, it's there in, in your training as a biologist. You now belong to a tribe of cognitive neuroscientists who are a great tribe to belong to. They all do yoga, go jogging, and, you know, hold exciting jobs and exciting labs. But actually, don't really believe in free will. And if you're going to stay part of that tribe, you need to sign up to that. And also in the radio documentary, you said something really interesting to Gina Rippon when you said, actually, as a mother of a small child, there's something kind of reassuring to maybe think that most of this is already fixed and I can't really, did you say, mess it up too much? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, so on, on the one side, you've got quite a lot of good reasons to have the views that you have, as well as the fact that clearly you, you were predetermined to have them. Um, but then in the book, you meet someone and you encounter Rowan Williams, who's a very good friend of Greenbelt. Mm -hmm. And... The whole book, one of the things you do is you talk about the people that you go to talk to, and, ha and, and they're all really nice people and interesting, but actually the way you write about your meeting with Rowan is a bit different, and I think he sort of threw a little bit of, if not an intellectual spanner into the works, at least an emotional one. Hmm. But do, you, do you want to just say a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I'm very lucky in that I, um, Rowan is Master of Magdalen College, which I'm an outreach fellow at, and I've um, got a huge ama amount of admiration for him and his wife, Jane. Uh, who've done phenomenal things. Um, and he, he very kindly gave me some time to have a conversation with him about free will, in which he actually got quite het up and said, well, I think a lot of science is absolute complete and utter bollocks, Hannah. <laughs> I was like, whoa! See, we used to have a prophet for an archbishop. Now we have a diplomat. 
<laughs> I think he said, well, what, no, what would happen if I said that to you, Hannah? But he said it with quite a lot of emotional force. <laughs> um, because he's interested speech... in linguistic complexity, isn't he, amongst yeah. other things? Yeah, and, we, and he said, you know, so there's been there was some studies in the 1980s by Benjamin Libbe that was looking at whether we have free will or whether it's an illusion, and this is the classic kind of experiment. And both Rowan and I actually agreed that really, what does this experiment show? It's, it's, it's reduced this idea of free will down to its very kind of um, simple thing that actually, what does this, what implication does this have in real life? So w what Benjamin did is that he, um, uh, he measured the electrical activity in the motor cortex, which is a region of the brain that goes from ear to ear. And there's a region of the motor cortex here, which kind of here, about here, which uh, directs movement within your hand. Uh, and they also picked up the electrical activity of the muscles uh, in the hand moving. And uh, the volunteers were looking at a clock. So they were, the, the volunteers were saying what time they were deciding that they wanted to move their hand. And what came first was the electrical activity in the brain initiating the direction of movement. And then there was the conscious awareness of, oh, I'm going to decide to move my hand after the brain had actually decided to do it. And then lastly came the movement of the hand. And that experiment has been repeated and refined many times. So and it seems to indicate that the free will is largely illusion. Roughly and what it means is the hands were moving before people had decided to that's the sort of idea. No, the brain was instructing the hand to move before the person had thought that they were deciding to move. So the brain... The brain was in charge. The brain was in charge more than your conscious awareness and your you know, decision making. You know, that happens making. so much with my hands. <laughs> and glasses. <laughs> and <laughs> Be careful there. <laughs> Um, so, so, so Rowan and I were talking about this and then also the more recent kind of looks at the, the neural circuitry kind of in, within the baby and the more, um, the more recent genomic studies that were coming out. And he basically, and, and there have also been some studies looking at what happens if you erode a number of people's idea that they have free will. If you just completely shatter this notion that we have any free will and that we are just these almost robots that are acting in a way that was really largely predetermined, then what happens as a society? And what you see um, time and time and time again when scientists have studied this is that actually people start to act much more selfishly. Yes. They just say, as, a, as you know, my brain made me do it. I have no responsibility. And so it doesn't really matter. I am just a, um, you know, a predetermined robot that is acting as I want to. And so obviously that's not a positive thing. That's not a positive message that I want people to take away from this book. And so what he said was that and we had this wonderful conversation about actually, you know, he, he was saying maybe I want to, or maybe I am predetermined to want to discuss ideas with people, but that is the only way that we can actually alter the, the world around us in a more positive way, is by sharing up our perspective and going back to this idea of how our reality is slightly skewed and that, um, you know, we are pre-wired within each all, all of us to move around the world, to navigate our world and to try and exchange ideas and to interact with other people and to show a little bit of compassion as well. And so his case is that the, it, it's the interaction with other people that creates the change. And what's stunning in the book is it seems to me that him saying that to you and you meeting him actually sets off a kind of a change in you. Maybe that was predetermined. <laughs> <laughs> in including the fact you've decided to get a little bit more involved in the church than you might have done. Yeah, so actually, yeah, so um, a few months after that uh, interview, he christened and confirmed both my, me, myself and my son, which was wonderful. Just astonishing. Yeah, really lovely. Yeah. And, and, you, and we, we had a conversation about some of your reasons for that. And a lot of that was about the nature of the church community and the need, particularly bringing a child up for more people being involved with each other's lives. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I mean, any kind of spiritual belief, I think, you know, it offers this wonderful way of helping people to um, become part of a community, to share a collective consciousness where we're all striving for something that's much more positive for everybody and to help support each other and also hopefully, you know, nurture um, all, all the breadth of human uh, behaviours that we can exhibit. So it's got to be a positive thing. And if you want to see a breadth of human behaviour, Sunday morning, half past ten. Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. Look, um, we're, we're going to open up to some questions in a, in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, are there particular things, though, s s some people have different relationships to the things that you're talking about. 
are there key things that you'd really hope people might take away to either think about or talk about or hold on to or use for themselves? Um, I think it's, uh, I think for me, it's been, you know, it could be this really depressing message. And, I, and in fact, I did, it was, it was this time last summer that uh, I was, um, you remember last summer, it was this apocalyptic summer and it just got overwhelmingly hot, actually. And I was writing the last kind of bits of the book and then the editor um, called me and said, oh, Hannah, you know that we've just done a word count and you're 10,000 words short. You've got to write an extra couple of chapters. <laughs> and then there's this, this hot, apocalyptic kind of sun. And I was despairing, actually, for all of us as individuals and, and our future generations as well. Um, and then I started writing um, and doing a lot more research on, um, on the neuroscience and the science of compassion mm. and how we can start cultivating that. And the Dalai Lama came and gave um, a, a, a plenary talk to, at the Science Society for Neuroscience um, annual meeting um, a while back. So he delivered a talk to over 30,000 neuroscientists that converged across the world who were there listening to what he was saying. And, and, and he's been, and this, this talk actually gave rise to a lot of collaborations looking at um, how we can start as scientists, because we like as scientists to understand things, because then we can maybe get a grapple on it a little bit more for our minds. Um, uh, the science of compassion. And there's some really lovely things that have come out of the Oxford handbook of com the science of compassion. Um, and they're probably things that we all intuitively know. And this is, I think this is, this, is, this is generally true of science. A lot of it is stuff that we all intuitively know, you know? But sometimes it's, it's nice to have some molecular pathway in our mind that helps us to understand what's going on or, or to have some brain scan image in our head that helps us to comprehend what's happening, why we're feeling these, this mix of emotions. For me, it helps me to understand and, and hopefully to act with more compassion. And there's some ways that you can also help trigger more compassion within yourself and within others. So one of them is practicing a gratitude journal. Uh, at the end of each day, I write down three things that I'm grateful for. And, so and, and you do know this is part of early church Celtic ritual practice. Ah, okay. So right, okay. So, yeah, you've so done, you're, you're the ones that have done... One of my students at Leeds mm. did a, a, her doctoral thesis based around um, gratitude to, as an aid to solving insomnia. Uh -huh. uh, using exactly this positive psychology model of writing three things down. And then I'm in the, the Glade um, on Friday night, and the guy's going, so in the quietness, just identify seven different kinds of sounds. So I was thinking, I can hear bass, I can hear lead guitar, I can hear... <laughs> but as we said night prayer, we came to this line, which I've, I've lost the words of it, but was, you know, about, you know, and at the end of this day, I, I remember these three things that you have given me, O oh Lord. So, like you said, a lot of these are things that we've kind of known for a long time. People like you know, mm -hmm. you now are explaining to us with force why they work, why they're important. Yeah, and it's you know, and there's something quite beautiful about how these these things that we intuitively know as a species have been passed across generations yes. using religion or using whatever kind of um, route, whatever mechanism uh, to help us as a species to to hold compassion for each other and, and to hopefully hold a productive and positive life. 